Greetings from Grand Canyon. I'm Ranger Grace, and I work at Desert View as Grand Canyon's Cultural Demonstration Program Coordinator. The purpose of the Cultural Demonstration Program is to give members of the 11 traditionally associated tribes a voice here at Grand Canyon by encouraging interactions with the public through demonstrations of traditional native crafts. The program began in 2014 and continues today with the support of Grand Canyon Conservancy. This program has transformed Desert View into a place to celebrate, share, and learn about intertribal cultural heritage. Since the program began, the park has hosted more than 175 artists from the 11 traditionally associated tribes of Grand Canyon. This cultural demonstration program provides the opportunity for visitors to learn more about each tribe's culture, their history, and the skills, knowledge, and efforts involved in creating each craft. With the spread of COVID-19, we wish to keep you and our cultural demonstrators safe while continuing to share their rich cultural heritage and crafts. To that end, we've created experience for you with the help of our cultural demonstrators. Please sit back and enjoy learning about native crafts, the artists, and their ties to Grand Canyon. Hello, I'm Alyssa Ojeda, Marketing and Public Relations Manager for Grand Canyon Conservancy, the official nonprofit partner of Grand Canyon National Park. We work hand in hand with the Park Service to provide educational opportunities and digital programming to keep you connected to Grand Canyon. Thanks to your ongoing support, we're able to share this new series, History Behind the Arts, providing you an in-depth look at the Cultural Demonstrator Program at Grand Canyon. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the Cultural Demonstrator Program Coordinator, Grace Lilly. Hello, thank you for joining us today. We have the pleasure of talking with Dwayne Moktaima. He's a metal smith jeweler joining us from his home today in Glorieta in Northern New Mexico. Dwayne is also a cultural arts liaison and has studied prehistoric native uh, Southwest people's jewelry. And thank you for joining us today, Dwayne. Care to start by sharing a little bit about yourself and what drew you into the arts? Yes, I'm very uh, pleased and, and um, honored to be part of the, this event. Yeah, my name, uh, again, referring back to my name, uh, Dwayne Moktaima. Uh, the, the last name, Moktaima, is my, my uh, grandfather's uh, <clears throat> uh, heritage, uh, Hopi name. And I'm um, Hopi on my dad's side and Laguna Pueblo on my mother's side. And uh, traditionally, the way it goes in uh, Pueblo culture, it, which Hopi is part of that group, um, we follow our mother's clans. So although my name, you know, is, is uh, the American version of how naming is, my grandfather, that was my grandfather's Indian name. And uh, being involved in, you know, historical events in his, in his time, lifetime, of course, that was in the early 1900s, you know, he was allowed, not, not by easy choice, but uh, he was allowed in when he was take, forced to go to uh, school, uh, they gave him English names and he didn't want to answer to it. So that's, that, would, that name he stuck was was very stubborn about it and wouldn't answer to any other name. I, I don't know what the name they gave him was, but his not, his last name they allowed him after a while. He he finally the school finally allowed him to keep his Indian name as his last name. So Muktaima is the pronunciation for it. Being on the on the being of Hopi heritage, um, it's something you know we follow. The one thing I forgot to mention is that. You know, our fathers, we follow our fathers, so to speak, um, ceremonial life. Uh, they're the ones, uh, how would you say, to teach the young, the young boys or young men as they grow up in this world to, um, how would you say, uh, to have a mentor, an example. So growing up being Hopi, you know, I saw I was, uh, I was very, um, um, lucky to have a, uh, my grandfather, Moktaima, was still living. So his influence had a, a lot of, uh, how would you say, impact on my growing up. My grandfather was a Kachina carver and, um, you know, knew all the, um, how would you say, ceremonial folk arts or folk arts in general of, you know, that was their ways of uh, making a living. Not only was he, um, uh, had 
some sort of an education through, um, you know, the um, uh, early education system of um, dealing with Native American people in the Southwest, but he also was uh, in the military. He was in the 1st Regiment National Guard of Arizona, so, and a musician on top of that. So he was actually a contemporary in his own time in the 1920s, you know, in the, well, the late uh, 1919 is when he started this activity after he finished school and all that. But, um, you know, this, this is, um, he had a lot of metaphors for um, using, uh, you know, how would you say our ancestral heritage? And uh, like one of the things he always said was, um, you know, you know, be resourceful. You know, there's, there's, uh, you can make a living or supplement your income by doing some of these traditional arts and crafts forms. And it doesn't cost you anything. It's all naturally there. You know, you just have to go up and get it, you know, like for kachina carvers, you know, you can go to the little Colorado river and get the, the cottonwood root to carve. And so we did a lot of that growing up, which was always a lot of fun going, going along the river all day, collecting wood. And, um, we always uh, collected a lot of uh, wood. It, the wood is used for making rattles, for the handles, and then, you know, for carving for dolls. And, and uh, oh, he did, he was very resourceful. He even, believe it or not, would keep um, uh, uh, neck bones of, uh, you know, from after uh, cooking a, a meal, a stew. And he made these little beadwork things out of them and made bolo ties from them. So I saw and became, pretty much emulated my grandfather, always uh, crafting. And when I was about nine years, eight or nine years old, that's when I started helping my grandfather do his major craft work, which was, um, by then he was um, in the late sixties, he was retired from uh, working for the Santa Fe Railroad. And, uh, you know, he had, he, he was, uh, he was pretty well off for his, his uh, generation. You know, he, he used to boast about his, uh, he got, he was always expressing that he had three retirement, uh, you know, benefits coming in. On my mother's side, um, they are as well resourceful people. They're Pueblo people of New Mexico. But in 1919, um, because of the, the Santa Fe Railroad who came to the Laguna Pueblo Feast Day in around 1915 to recruit young married couples to work for the Santa Fe Railroad. So very interesting um, how would you say endeavor for these 78 young married couples moved to Winslow, Arizona in 1919 to work for the Santa Fe Railroad. They provided housing for them and there was a little colony outside on the west side of Winslow, Arizona called the Laguna Indian Colony. And uh, in in uh, slang terms, it was called the camp and all, everybody in Winslow knew where the camp was. And so that was why, I guess, uh, uh, well, we're Pueblo people. So we spoke different languages, but um, for some reason, the, the songs and the dances they share are all similar. So it was pretty remarkable how these two communities uh, in Winslow, Arizona overlapped and they helped each other, which is pretty phenomenal. So a lot of intermarriages happened because of that, you know, being in that group, uh, you know, they were, they were isolated in a way, both, both, um, but it was a means of economic, uh, you know, uh, uh, how would you, economics and to financially support uh, a family in a new world. This was all a new world to them because they had just come out of, uh, how would you say, uh, many issues dealing with the federal government where, you know, now they had to give up their old ways of life, you know, like being hunter gatherers and uh, livestock and, you know, sheep herding from introduced by the Spaniards, you know, in the, in the 1700s. So that way of life was, um, it impacted the people immensely. So, you know, because of that, there were, uh, uh, there were at these two particular places in, for instance, um, they had uh, uh, revolts and revolutions among their own people, civil war, so to speak. There was a, a, a you know, a progressive and uh, traditional uh, uprising in Laguna Pueblo, and the result of that was the highlight of that was in 18 around 1860. There was a major split where um, you know the traditionals were ousted out of Old Laguna because you know 
uh, well, actually, after the Civil War, the government came in there and started letting the the people know of Laguna Pueblo that things were going to change. There was a railroad that was going to run through their most sacred, um, uh, how would you say, their most sacred shrine, which was a lake that used to sit outside the village on the west side. And it was a very, very prolific um, spiritual center for them. That lake no longer exists because the uh, the Army Corps of Engineers of after the Civil War came and blasted the dam, the natural volcanic lava flow dam of over a million years ago that dammed up the, the lake, the river, the San Jose River and created a lake. And uh, so that, that you know, uh, nobody had control. I mean, nobody knew how to uh, deal with uh, a new entity of uh, people, you know, so that is uh, kind of another, how would you say, uh, in, uh, vision or enlightenment that uh, the native people had to start succumbing to another culture, influencing their culture. And so, you know, so at the time my grandparents left Olaguna, you can imagine in those days, it was just like, like uh, very tight families, you know, three generations living in a household, so to speak. Uh, it, you've heard that we've all heard that term it takes a village to raise a child well that actually still went on prolifically in those days but you can imagine when they took their most sacred element away of their of their religion that sacred lake that that just created a chaos among their people so in a nutshell I remember asking interviewing my grandparents about this and from Laguna and they said well we had to ask permission from my parents when we got when we went to visit the the booth at the the Laguna feast day about recruiting work looking for uh, workers to come to Winslow Arizona for the Santa Fe Railroad so we had to ask our parents permission and they were already young adults uh, around 19 years of age 20 years old and um, I thought that was kind of you know being a contemporary Indian already in in, in growing up in the in the 60s thought that was kind of like wow i never really realized it you know and and it, but later on as i grew older i could understand where they were coming from well they had to ask their parents uh, for permission to leave the laguna pueblo land and they prolifically gave them permission and told them things were changing in their world and that they knew that in the future their grandchildren and great grandchildren, which I am a great grandchild of that family, that um, they would, uh, uh, how would you say, we would have to empower ourselves through another learning the, how would you say, a contemporary, how to live in a contemporary world, and that's having a better education and and uh, being able to communicate in more ways than we normally would. So Native American people today have. Um, um, how would you say the the Pueblo people of the Southwest and the Indians of the Southwest? That's the scenario we deal with, and is to retain our culture, but yet through my expression of art, um, I can I can. How would you say? Uh, I think it's fascinating for people that they see that this is still a living, thriving culture. We haven't given up. We haven't we haven't tossed those old traditions aside yet. We're still continuing the legacy of our ancestors. And yeah. I think that's probably, and the same thing happened at Hopi with my grandfather's village in 1906, there was a split there. Uh, and the, the village that was created as a result of that, which my grandfather was part of that group was at Hope Villa, Arizona, which is on the Hopi reservation. It's the newest uh, 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 village of Hopi basically, but it's, uh, you know, um, that's where my grandmother and grandfather were from, um, Mukdaima. So, you know, I got to hear a lot of that story too from him because he was still alive and he witnessed it. He was involved in that. He was 10 years old when that, that happened in 1906. So he been, then being in the military, being learning the discipline of what education can bring you, his whole outreach to our family even my parents, my dad, I mean, my dad, my uncle, and my aunt, on my whole crew side, they all went to college. And so my dad's a graduate of Northern Arizona University in business. And, you know, it wasn't, didn't take much for me to realize through my grandfather's advice that education was a, a, a key to my success in the future. 
and uh, but for some reason, um, I had this really amazing feeling for doing art. You know, so art wasn't hard for me. I think I think three dimensionally, which you know, in jewelry metalsmithing, that's where that's where that comes from is um, the fact that I can I can see something and see the hidden uh, depths of it. You know, the three dimensionality of what the outcome would be if it was a piece of wood or you know, uh, a piece of clay or, you know, or a painting or whatever. I, you know, I, in art school, I had to take um, all these kind of courses and I did pretty well at all of them, but jewelry and it was metalsmithing was my passion. Uh, I think I was first introduced to jewelry because of my, one of a, one of, one of my uncles uh, did jewelry and uh, it was very contemporary for its time. So, he went to the first beginning of uh, the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and his teacher was Charles Lolama, which everybody in in the in the historic uh, art world knows who Charles Lolama was. He's from Hopeville, Arizona, where my grandfather was from. Uh, he also was uh, a graduate of a, a university art program in New York, and um, so, but mainly he was in ceramics, but he did take jewelry classes, I think, and uh, knew how to make jewelry. So that was where he made his success. He was internationally well known uh, before he died and left us a legacy to follow. As far as like, there was, uh, you know, today Native American jewelry contemporary, you can see all kinds of materials used in, um, in uh, jewelry. And for being a Pueblo and a Hopi, um, those materials, I mean, it's basically, I'm going to show this picture here. It's an Arizona Highways magazine. I just found this the other day. And it's a picture of a headdress that a, that a lady's getting ready to go out and dance for the butterfly dance. So you can see those prolific colors. If you look in the Grand Canyon, those colors are not, you know, uh, they're not, uh, how would you say, it, that's what you see in the canyon is all those colors, the rainbow colors. So in jewelry, that's that's what I can borrow from, you know, those same elements are in the in the minerals and the, the stones we use, which we honor those, um, you know, by uh, being sacred materials uh, that we borrow from the earth to use. And that's again comes back to that whole metaphor that my grandfather said that all these materials are available to you. All you have to do is go out and find it, and make you can make a living from it but always respect it and always honor it, you know, because it comes from the earth, which is uh, in our traditions, our, um, in our teachings that we learn that the earth is sacred. All of its uh, uses are for, you know, for uh, the purpose of perpetuating our lives. So that's one of the elements that I'm so grateful I got to learn and understand that. But jewelry making in South has been a tradition that goes back to in millennia. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's sources, I think, um, being that, believe it or not, many of our, our ancestral stories or the beginnings of our migrations coming to this land of North America, they came from elsewhere. They came from, believe it or not, I think a lot of them, they, of course, water is a very important element of survival. So I think many of our, for instance, my grandfather used to always talk about his clan and being a snake clan from, and he, he used to refer that at some point way, way back, they came from the Bay Area around San Francisco. That was one of their, 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 their migration stories that they, that he mentioned several times. And so they were, they had access, access to shells. And so you can think back that shells were probably the most prolific beginning of jewelry that people wore. And I have an example right here. I'm going to hold this up. And this is a, uh, a spiny oyster shell. And you can see it's, it's a bivalve and it opens here. There was an oyster inside it that's edible, which that's what you do. You go and you know how to use uh, what's natural. You eat it. And then after this is done, you would grind the spines down. And this is what you end up with is colored, is a colored shell, which is either orange, uh, goes into reds, and it goes into yellows, and as well as, as these abalone shells, which are, these are Pacific 
um, uh, particular shells that I'm holding up. This is a small abalone from, uh, I think this is, comes from the Gulf of California. It has a lot more color to it. So these are particular things, and in, in, uh, I don't have any, you know, like ancient historic I, examples of jewelry making, but um, this is this is what I'm talking about in the history of the Southwest. This is something that he evolved out of the jewelry making process in the Southwest, honoring the shell and and the symbolism that goes on, the color of the stones and the turquoise. And these are glycerinous shells from the Gulf of California. And, um, you know, since then, I mean, this, this particular type of uh, traditional bead necklace, this goes back millennia. So, the process of how how this was achieved or done is just is phenomenal and that was where what was really in, empowering in an education that i had i had access to libraries as a as a you know who would ever thought a jeweler would just really research this and it was a passion for me it got to be a passion to learn the prehistory of jewelry making in the southwest so I found a lot of good examples uh, in the library in either book formats of uh, archaeological digs. The Grand Canyon in particular had some shell jewelry forms that, that was excavated out of ruins in the, Grand, in the canyon, uh, as well as prolifically all over Arizona and New Mexico. So, so that opens up another door, which, how did they get these materials? It, it had to been, it had to have been trade. So there was a connection between, um, the people of the coastal areas as these other natives who had moved into the inner inlands of the, the southwest and how that that uh, community was never it, that door was always open to uh, acquire materials for trade for and like for jewelry making for instance so um, it just really opens up a lot of doors i can get into more other stone materials which i have a lot of examples of and that's how I, the studying of prehistoric jewelry of the Southwest is what allowed me to start appreciating uh, my own, uh, how would you say, um, uh, research in developing a style that's totally unique to my own. And it's based on the shell jewelry format. Wonderful. Thanks, Dwayne. That was a really yeah. Uh, to be able to hear all those histories. So it sounds like you like to use a lot of those natural uh, materials, but times have changed and I'm sure you have a lot of different tools that you use today than um, your ancestors did when they were first making jewelry. Do you mind sharing some of the tools and techniques that you go through? Oh yeah, well first off, you know, we don't no longer have to, uh, up until um, probably the 1930s, um, you know, you'll see examples of old um, uh, silver work and, uh, you know, you know, in the 1930s silver was, um, because of the re the depression years, uh, precious metals were not allowed by anybody to be purchased uh, because of uh, use. Uh, it was the it was actually this the you know how would you say it was the currency of the United States. So the federal government um, put a um, how would you say a a, um, a damper on anybody could not buy and sell acquire buy or sell. Um, uh, precious metals, sterling, uh, silver or gold. But uniquely, what happened was, and the be, before that, most of the jewelry was made from coins, coin silver anyway, which at that time was pretty much uh, had a little bit of an alloy to it. I guess it would be a little lesser than sterling silver, which is 9.25 fine silver, and um, so. They were making a lot of the older jewelry before 1930 was made out of coin silver. And you can imagine just pounding out these thick one, uh, what do you call them, silver dollars or Mexican silver dollars or whatever, whatever you could get your hands on. And those are in a, in a, in a, another way, they're collectible pieces because of that era. And that's what gives it its, um, providence. But today, after 1930s, and this is what's really unique about the Southwest. I will share this with you because I knew this family in, in Gallup, New Mexico, the Woodard family. I was honored to my first gallery, contemporary gallery I worked with, was uh, owned by Tom Woodard. And his father 
was a uh, the owner of one of the newspapers in Gallup, New Mexico, uh, around I guess in the 30s. And it was through Mr. Woodard who owned the newspaper in Gallup. Uh, you know, of course, they're affiliated with a lot of politics because they, you know, they have to write about issues and for their papers. Got to know a lot of politicians, and there was a big, big, um, uh, how would you say, awareness that the Native Americans up until that time they could they they were having a hard time economically because they got so used to selling their jewelry wear and they no longer could buy get metal anywhere. They couldn't use coins. They could. They were defacing uh US currency so they would be actually reprimanded if they were caught you know buying and manipulating points so mr woodard uh with the help of uh political representatives of the state of new mexico got legislation passed to allow just native americans to buy and purchase precious metals and they didn't have a source to do this so mr woodard himself created the Indian Jewelry Supply Company in Gallup, New Mexico. And so this is this is what we use today. Because of his uh, benefit, we buy silver in this format now. It's already processed in sheets, and uh, this has numbers on it because this is the gauge I use. This is a thinner gauge, and this is a thicker gauge, 20 gauge. And then from that, I'm able to manipulate this metal and make textures, but that's an embossed texture that I use. I, I run it through my rolling mill. And what I'm doing, what I'm trying to emulate here is uh, the tufa cast uh, look. You know, it's the sandstone casting that they do, but it's very costly and expensive, especially now if you notice the price of metals has gone back up. Well, I found this out in 1978, when there was a huge increase because of um, a, a manipulative scam that happened in the stock market with precious metals. Precious metals in 1978 went up to $50 an ounce. And uh, no, everybody just quit making jewelry. I had to quit. I had to quit a year and a half because it, I, I couldn't sell the work. I couldn't, you know, it was got so out of reach you know, for, for people to afford to buy it because you had to buy the material and then you have to price it in, factor it into the price. So from this material here, so that was what was unique about me going back to college because, um, you know, I got to learn what fabricating, being a metalsmith was about. And so some of the, some of the pieces I do today, oh, well, all the pieces I do, I'm very proud of this, is I do fabrication. And this is an example of what fabrication is. This is heavy gauge, really thick sheet that I form by hand in a in the tooling that I have, uh, you know, through my education learned what to use. And this is the tool that makes that piece. This is this is really odd. It's called a snake stake. And I'm able to 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 emulate what I was what I was telling to myself to do was to emulate shell forms, the shells that come from the ocean. These are organic forms. Isn't that amazing how that form it looks so organic and it's very comfortable to wear because anything organic just seems to have a natural, just from the name of, of itself, seems to have a natural, just a natural grace to it. And so this is how this is made. It's put into this shape in a flat sheet form like this is the flat part. It's not formed at all yet. And then so what I have to do is I stick, I put this piece, so to speak, in this in this anvil. And then I use this particular hammer, which is wedge shape on both sides. These I make myself. And uh, these, these forms too I can make. These are out of coil springs, out of an automobile. That you, he, I took blacksmithing in college, so I learned how to do this. So what you're going to do is you're going to compress this metal into this form with this, this nylon hammer. And then this is the end result is getting this, this shape, which is a concave. I call it a shell form bracelet. That's the name of that piece. And uh, from that piece, from that piece, you can manipulate this and you can dissect this in half. If you were to cut this right down the middle on the center, you would have two separate pieces and you could invert them. And then you would have this, two 
see the concave part here that was the original form and this this is uh six solder steps to get to this part and this has a channel inside see this in here which ends up you have a channel to inlay your bracelets and the stones that go in it and um again emulating the shell form jewelry of the of you know that whole concept of honoring a natural organic shape and form now the materials are different but i'm borrowing because of my education i was a painter as well i prolifically did a lot of painting in college and i could have gone that route but for some reason just hands-on with three-dimensional art and jewelry just became a passion for me like uh, in this bracelet for instance you're going to see some grays and blues and blacks and orange and and black and white and of course turquoise so i'm going to hold up these stones this is what natural turquoise looks like this is purely natural no enhancement done to it this is from the kingman turquoise mines in kingman arizona and so you know this has to be cut and and ground and uh, shaped different colors turquoise comes in different shades of the original color the the oranges or the reds i use um this is rosarita and it's you know today with today's um i am aware of being a native american that uh you know the impact on mining uh, this is arizona zebra jasper isn't this pretty and this comes from prescott there's a gentleman that i met uh it's probably been over 30 at least 30 years now he's from Prescott, Arizona. He's a geologist by profession, and he mines by himself. It's not a big operation where this is what I'm always leery of because I don't want to buy stuff from people that tear mountains apart. You know what I mean? I'd rather have somebody that does it discreetly and has a lot of, uh, how would you say, perception and, and uh, uh, how would you say, uh, spiritual uh, regard to the environment and doesn't impact it in any way. But this is Arizona Zebra Jasper. It's a black and white stone, and I use this prolifically, and that's what's in this bracelet. It's a very hard stone. It's a jasper. And uh, let's see, this is black jade. I use a lot of this. This, believe it or not, comes right, right outside your area near Flagstaff. And this is actually a true jade. This is black, like pure black in color, like a rich, rich luster black. There's a piece of that you know in a small slice but you can see how black it is but it actually when i grind it in the, in the lap on the lapidary machine on the wheels that i use diamond abrasives you, the water turns actually dark dark green so it's a true jade and what jade is you have to learn a little bit about geology as well it's a it's a it's a chromium uh material it's it's the, the basic mineral is chrome so that's what it's a green chrome is green so that's these are all kind of things I've had to educate myself over the years um, in learning about all these type of things. Those are some of the elements. I'll just hold up some other things that I've done from my bench. Um, these are works in progress. This is actually a piece. This is this is one here that I'm wearing. I'm wearing this right now, but this is a smaller version. It's, you know, more petite. And uh, you can see where I fabricated everything, the back, the plate that I showed you that I emboss, And then um, the little arrowheads um, are symbolic to, this is, this is basically, everything has a meaning to me in my work. And how this starts out a lot in my work is I draw a lot of things, I sketch. Being that I have an art background, this is probably one of eight books that I have, sketchbooks. And I do a lot of commission work for people. So like you'll see, you'll see notes on my sketches, like for the particular gentleman that I'm making this for and what his wrist size is and what he does like or doesn't like symbolism. And I do both like, uh, we call it Hopi overlay or plate on plate designs. Uh, I do a lot of uh, different um, types of elements like that. And this is, this is a, a necklace canteen, a miniature, like a perfume bottle that I did as a project. And uh, this actually went to the Hopi Education Endowment Fund 
as a donation piece. Me and Burma and Nakwati were made uh, from Hoodville. And uh, this is the original sketch, so to speak. And, uh, but yeah, everything is uh, pretty much primarily sketched and um, shapes are natural organic shapes that I love to use. Like, um, oh, I, like this is a star, uh, I don't know what would you call it, it's a diamond shape, but it's just one of those, you know, this come, this symbol comes from um, like uh, some of the embroidered uh, ceremonial uh, wear that the men wear when they're dancing. And this is a particular like diamond shape that's in that, that the kilt they wear on one of the types of kilt they embroider. This is another, this is a dangle pair of earrings with rosarita, opal, and sterling silver. And that's the backs that I use. Um, I, I make things that are substantial that will last for the, basically I want things to last not just for the life of the owner, but to be passed on a legacy. And that's the one benefit of what I've done over the years is the career that I've had. My work now shows up on the second generation market. I've been doing this since 1974. This is my 46th year of making jewelry as a profession. And uh, I started out at the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff. Well, actually I was a college student, but uh, the professor retired and went to the Museum of Northern Arizona to start an art institute. And uh, I was very fortunate that I had talent that I guess he saw and he took me with him to the museum in Northern Arizona. And I was an artist in residence there for a three year pilot program. And that's where I realized how important culture was because many, many people came to the museum and uh, famous people and people who to give, to give philanthropy. <clears throat> and they would call me an artist and I was only 19 years of age. And I used to get very, very intimidated by that. I used to, I used to uh, tell people, oh, excuse me, I'm not an artist. I'm just a craftsman. Because I felt like that word was a big, you know, it was a big word. And uh, you have to have credentials to back that up. And I didn't, I felt I didn't at the time because I was still a kid. I felt like I was still, didn't know anything about the world yet. Thank you, Dwayne, for sharing so much about how your culture is expressed in your work and the processes you go through. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about how you connect to Grand Canyon personally or even culturally, um, some of the ties you might have here. Grand Canyon, it's amazing. Um, of course, you know, it's, the, it's one of the uh, emergence uh, shrines of the Hopi people. And being that I'm part Hopi, my grandfather always you know, related a lot of stories, especially his clan, you know, the snake people of, of uh, Third Mesa, you know, they, you know, he, he often expressed that, you know, they came from that area, but mainly more north of where present day Hopi is, but, you know, but the whole canyon, I'm sure, you, you know, they had to familiarize themselves, the use, the uses of it. But you can imagine as well that it was a place of refuge whenever there was, uh, you know, um, I would say major catastrophes or, 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 you know, endeavors where they had to escape somewhere. And it was a place where they went. On the other hand, um, <clears throat> on my Laguna side, the Colorado, the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon also has uh, history too, because um, the Laguna people believed uh, that when they left Mesa Verde, all the Puebloan people of the Southwest and at one point in their their cultural time resided in the Mesa Verde country, which is not just exclusive to, uh, how would you say, uh, east, southeast of uh, Cortez, Colorado, but there was prolifically uh, people settled all like probably 60, 70 miles on both sides of that and all around it. And so the, there is a story at Laguna Pueblo uh, being that, you know, I went, I went back home to my mother's village because I did I did have a, a very distinguished connection because of my grandparents I grew up with them too my mom's side and I was very close to my grandmother and grandpa they speak a totally different language but the culture is the same they have a lot of the similarities in dancing and ceremony honoring the solstices just like at Hopi and that always had had me how would you say uh wondering you know the the whys and uh and the you know 
Why is it they're so separate? You know, why are they so far apart? And I turned out that one one time at a particular solstice feast we have at Laguna Pueblo, we, I sing, I'm a singer there. Uh, and um, one of the songs we sing is the last song of the four days ceremony. It's the last song they sing and it's about, it's about these two leaders that left the Mesa Verde country at one way, way back in around maybe 1100 AD. And the song sings about how they took two different groups of people to end up in their final resting, their final place where they would live the rest of their fraternity. And one group went down the Colorado River and came and made a circle, a loop. And the other group came down to the Rio Grande River and made a loop. And, and they both ended up at Laguna within a certain year time frame. And so that migration is very symbolic about, because there is a ruins at, at Hopi called Kowaik, and that's, that is what the name of our Laguna village is at Laguna Pueblo in our native Karis language. It's called Kowaik. And there's a ruin at Hopi, and it's just uh, southeast of Palaka. Uh, on Antelope Mesa, and it and there are stories of of um, uh, listening to the old grandfathers. When I had moved home, I was very fortunate that I got to experience that too, because that gener the the last generation of uh, elders. After that generation, things prolifically changed. You know, uh, progress, uh, contemporary life moved in very rapidly. And so I got to hear little bits and pieces and remnants of stories and folk tales or, you know, folk stories of, of, uh, of our connection with Hopi. So it's pretty remarkable, you know, that all these pueblos are all assimilated in, in history. And, uh, you know, not, not just Laguna Pueblo, but the Rio Grande Pueblos as well. So the Grand Canyon does have that purpose. There, there is a significance. In fact, that, that village at, at Hopi, I think because of that, there are stories even, and they name it, that they have names for like the Grand Canyon. They have a name for Mormon Lake because there was a village of terrorist people living there in Mormon Lake. And um, they talk about this war that, that happened there with, uh, I don't know what, Utes or Pai or Apache. Nah, it was way, way back. And uh, my one of my Indian names, for instance, is uh is the pacific ocean so their knowledge was vast and so one of the things that the grand canyon leads into the ocean you know the eventually gets there so that's the uh how would you say the impact of, of a natural wonder you know um you know and then talking about cataclysmic type events that made these migrations happen around that same time migration you have to factor in the fact that Sunset Crater erupted around 1100, 1200 AD. So you can imagine uh, the the natural uh, phenomenon of the of the of the sky going dark and blocking out the sun. The sun to the native people of the Southwest is the supreme being, the great spirit. He's in our languages we call him the Sun Father, you know, and he's always it's the number one. I would say. Uh, active shrine that we have that we pray to every day every, you know when he comes up in the morning and when he goes when he goes down at sunset and all the Pueblo and he including Hopis we all do that and so uh, so everything about the sun is uh, something it's also called mother and father not just father but they they honor it in both uh, gen, uh, how would you say um, uh, female and fem and male versions uh so it's honored in that way in fact when you mention it it's the first word that comes out is mother father and that's how you address the son in the morning you greet him like you would like good morning or whatever but in the language and so you know it's pretty amazing how uh and then and then another metaphor that the grand the older people used to say i used to hear my grandfather mock time always tell me this he used to say well remember you can't be lazy you're a you're a man and um, you have to you have to do like what the sun father does. He never rests during the day. He when he gets up, he's always busy working. So your day should be the same. 
and you should you should always be productive and be resourceful just like the sun father is throughout the day you know that's his time of big of work and at night it becomes the moon's work you know the nighttime people you know that kind of thing the stars come out you pray to the stars and the moon and the night moons, you know as a blessing so you know that that's the that would be for instance the the element in uh, that one piece that I showed I was showing you this uh, shell mosaic and uh, you'll see these black and white stones and that's what that significance is night and day and you know so so that that's uh, some of the metaphors that how would you say reminding us of uh, using the greatest elements and resources of this land we borrow you know we're actually that's another thing that we say our people we never say we own anything that's just amazing you know in today's world everybody owns things you know and uh, it's almost like um, uh, how would you say like you're lying about it <laughs> to our people it's like I have to really watch myself when I say I own something because that's the metaphor that our people don't have, we don't have it in our language. We don't have anything that says we own things. You know, we, we always say we borrow things. We borrow, we borrow all this, the creativeness we have, the, the stones we use that we get from the earth. There's even ceremonies, little ceremonies that we do when I get materials, acquired materials, like what I use for jewelry making. That I think that in itself will perpetuate your, uh, how would you say, the goodness of what you do, the blessings of your gifts. And my wife, that's my wife's job. She'll uh, put in, in a basket all the materials that we buy, like the stones, shells, if we do buy them, um, which, which is pretty much what you have to do today. It takes, you know, financial money to actually go out and use, buy these materials for perpetuation of what we believe in. And so she'll put it in a basket and we pray over it. We take it outside and pray with the, to the sun, thank him for, uh, how would you say, for this material we use, but also to excuse or exercise the fact that it was, a. we don't know how it was acquired. If it was for just greediness, personal gain, or the, the amount of people that were sacrificed to get the material. Some of this material is dangerously acquired. They go in they go in holes that they dig into the earth way back in there. A cave could collapse and cause injury to somebody. So we have to forgive that element of uh, how these materials were acquired. And another thing that our people do is that they sprinkle ashes over it, cedar ashes, to how would you say to forgive that bad uh tangent of whatever that that um you know, in Hopi, it's called Wimi, or in Laguna, it's called Kuite, uh, which means, uh, you know, that bad element or that greediness about it. You want to get rid of it. And because what I'm praying for is I'm going to ask the Great Spirit to allow me to use this material to borrow it, to perpetuate our family, our people, our culture. That's what I, that's what I express and wish for, for what I do. Because believe it or not, we still live in two worlds. I, we still have to, um, uh, we, there is a time when I have to go back to the Pueblo and, you know, participate in things. And uh, you have to, you know, just out of gener generosity of your own giving, you give. It's like giving to the church, right? Uh, we have different ways of donating or giving, but, you know, I'm always, uh, uh, I don't mind. I don't mind when, you know, it, the, the creator has blessed me with an immense talent and giving me an awesome life, a career that I just could not otherwise have achieved, I don't think, if I didn't have this understanding of where it comes from. Thank you. You've shared a lot of amazing things about your culture and your history. Um, and I just wanted to know, as you've kind of moved on with all this decades of experience, um, do you have any pivotal moments as an artist that you would like to share um, with the group today? Oh yeah, I have to say I work the patrons I have developed over the years, it's just pretty phenomenal, the the type of people that, uh, well, I don't mean to boast or, or put it in a context where it's just all about uh, my achievements, but I do a lot of work for uh, very uh, affluent people. Uh, I do a lot of commission work for lawyers and doctors, and one of the most significant um, metaphors I ever heard was from a, a lawyer 
a woman lawyer, in fact. And you know how uh, with today's issues about uh, women's rights and uh, the, how would you say, women in the workplace, um, you know, she, this one particular patron just shared this with me and I thought it was so, and they had never heard it this way, but she ordered some pieces from me. And she had been, she's, she's been a big avid collector of my work. Every year she would order something. So she had pretty good substantial collection, but she would, one year she told me, she goes, Dwayne, oh, this is just perfect. This is just what I need added to add to my collection. She goes, Dwayne, you know what I do. You know, I'm a lawyer and I work with a lot of men in this business. And I have to go to these really in, uh, intense meetings sometimes. And she said, one of the things that when I know I have these meetings, where these very powerful men are going to be in these meetings the night before I get my wardrobe together and I get my jewelry out and your stuff comes out. She goes, because the next day I'm putting your work on because it has that, I don't know, how would you say it has that, uh, I call it, she says, I call it power jewelry. She goes, it's like, it's like I become Wonder Woman. <laughs> she said it's it just empowers me to give me that strength and you know when she said that it just it just really dawned on me that you know that's not that's not how well I first of all it, it in it in its own right it's, it's just an honor and a flattering way to hear it but on the other hand the way I thought about it was all that spirituality that I that I encompassed from the learning and and on the experiences I've had with my people, the culture that's what that that's what that is. That's that that's the power of of uh, the connection of of my ancestry. And uh, that at that point told me you did it. You did it. You this is what you were trying to get to to achieve in your in your line of of your creative spirit. And this is what it means. This is what it's about. And so it re -honor, it made me rethink and honor myself again about just to keep that up and to perpetuate that, to always think of that because from then on, it just became more and more uh, at pretty much an everyday, uh, every patron account where this is what basically they all believe in is when they put on their, when they, and you know how a woman is when she goes out that door you know, there's a mirror in the hallway and uh, jewelry are talismans to people and uh, specifically uh, people with, uh, how would you say, a very um, um, e e eclectic life and, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's eccentric life. I don't know. But, you know, they go out that door. There's always a mirror in the hallway. And what do they do before they leave the door? They have to take one last look at themselves. And if those earrings or that pendant they're wearing or that necklace isn't isn't the one as they leave that door that they're not that they're comfortable with, what do the women do? They go run back up to their bedroom and change that look, and they get that piece that's going to make whoever they're going to plan to be with that day. It's a statement about who they really are. So that's I'm I'm very honored that I have achieved that in my career. I don't I don't um, how would you say I don't. I, I, uh, that's pretty much a guiding uh, spirit in my creativeness is, uh, not to, not to be, uh, uh, how would you say, not to be a sellout, not to be, uh, uh, um, a plagiarist. You know, I stick with what I know. I stick with, uh, who I am and I try to honor the ancestors of my people by what I do. And I think, I think myself, I'm happy. I'm very happy in my heart because I know my family's around me my ancestors are around me and uh you know that's one thing i know for sure is that if your wife still loves you at this being married to a wife 40 42 years that you know it we still laugh and, and my kids still love me and i love them you know deeply and um that's the thing that makes the most out of all this is that when they're happy then i guess i did something right and i'm very grateful for that do you have any words of wisdom that you would like to share with other artists um, that you've learned in your experience? Well, you, know, you just follow your dream. Um, you know, there's, and I, you know, I, I don't mean to be uh, uh, 
skeptical. I don't think that way, but um, a lot of times um, art can be very, very uh, hard, you know, to make a living as an artist. I was a teacher as well in my career. I was a I was a teacher in jewelry metal smithing at the Institute of American Indian Art. I had my own consulting business work helping tribes in Pueblo tribes in New Mexico for vocational training. And um, the thing that I learned the best was that I would tell my students, don't give up your day job yet. You know, because a lot of them thought they would learn how to make so be an artist and then just for the fact that art you can make a living at art, they they would just give up everything else. And then like what what was what happens you never know what's going to happen like i think i've been through some of the worst recessions and well i think some of the most prolific things that i experienced was desert storm 1990 and then 9 11. oh my goodness you know, those are things you totally don't expect and uh the economy suffer from that and what and art is one of those type of things that is a uh how would you say it's a luxury type of item that people buy when they have, when things are right, when things, the economies are great. You know, people don't mind uh, buying things for themselves to wear or art to hang on their walls or, you know, that kind of, or nice clothing, at, you know. So I'm very, uh, but I had good mentorship. My professors in college were artists as well as being professors. And I, I, I think one of the most prolific advices I ever got was this one professor, Jewish professor I had, Jake Brookins. He's been he's been gone now for about 20 years. Um, he was the one that took me to the museum in Northern Arizona. But one time he mentioned this. He says, Dwayne, he said, you got a lot of talent. He said, You're going to go far in this world. And he said, being a jeweler, he goes, I tell you, the reason I'm saying that is because throughout history, way back in history, even when there was kings and queens, Whenever there was a major um, disaster or, or where they had to run away or close up the, the, the towns that they were ruling in, they always had these secret places they would run. And you knew who they always took with them? I say, who? He goes, they always took their jewelers. <laughs> and you know what? That is so amazing that I am so... I'm living the life today because of the patrons I've developed in the 46 year career that I've had developed it. Take the time and really appreciate the patronage that you get as an artist because those people will come back to you over and over and over again. Even in this pandemic, I'm amazed how busy I am because I have these just most outrageous patrons that just you know they can afford to do things like this you know there are people and they will always be people that's the philanthropy of america that's the philanthropy that supports the national park service those are the kind of people I, that i i that support me you know that i'm just so honored to be in that light but the two other things is uh always be willing to share Always be willing to go above and beyond the 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 call call of duty. You know, like being a teacher, I I shared what I knew for many years. I was a board member of many nonprofits. I you know because of my passion, not only as an artist but for culture. I, I worked with a lot of cultural things, museums, uh, art shows. Uh, you know, uh, some smaller things like maybe tribal committees or you know, on arts and crafts, trying to develop stuff there. And artist in residence. Oh, I've been artist in, re in residence at the Amron Museum for the last three years. In the winter, I stayed there three months. What an awesome place to go for the winter in the, in the high desert of Arizona, southern Arizona, and interact with people that just, uh, just you know, it's, it's a winter time, how would you say, getaway, southern Arizona. A lot of people come from way up north, Canada, Minnesota, New York. Washington State, and I got to meet a lot of patrons and support there. And uh, but it's all because I what I've shared today. It's basically I'm sharing the same light uh, about the history of my people, knowing that um, I never knew that was going to be something that would be uh, something that people would be very curious about. Because I think in general most people are pretty ignorant 
about not in a negative way, but just the fact that you can't learn everything overnight or through a lifetime. And uh, that's a metaphor that I realize now more than ever. I'm I'm getting in up I'm getting up there in age now, and um, but I just feel like I've accomplished so much in my lifetime, and uh, I don't take anything for granted. That's another metaphor I always use. Uh, appreciate everything. I think with what I shared today about the natural stones, the natural materials I use, and the grateful thankfulness that that I, uh, how would you say, honor these materials because they come from a source that is uh, irreplaceable sometimes. It's getting more and more of that. We're putting more and more of that impact on the earth today than ever. And we need to really honor that and make people aware of it. And uh, being and handcrafting done by these digits. My grandfather used to say, the creator gave us all these things to allow us to live in this world. Eyes, a brain, hands, digits to work with your fingers, your feet, your legs to carry you around. And um, what better way to honor the great spirit than to do everything by hand? That's what my metaphor is. Try to keep, yeah, today's technology, it's, it's a very technical world. Uh, we're going into this uh, computer, everything. but. You know, I'm I'm a dinosaur. I'm I will be a dinosaur till I'm gone, and then I will fight for handcrafted everything because my ancestors did it, and so can I. have more questions or concerns I'm available thank you very much again I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge your experience and your skills with us today and it's an honor having you a part of our cultural demonstration program and we appreciate your efforts and helping more people feel connected to Grand Canyon its history and its spirit so thank you so much Dwayne oh you're welcome thank you and have a great day blessed day thank you Yes, and thank you, Dwayne and Grace. And to learn more about Dwayne and his jewelry, visit Pueblo5DecoDesign.com. And don't worry, we'll share all those links in the comments for you to go back and follow up with it. And Grand Canyon's Cultural Demonstrators Program is made possible with support and grants from Grand Canyon Conservancy and Art Place America. To learn more about artisans in this program, go to GrandCanyon.org forward slash demonstrators. Again, that's GrandCanyon.org forward slash demonstrators. Stay tuned for more history behind the arts features on both Grand Canyon National Park and Grand Canyon Conservancy's social media pages. Thank you for watching.